The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the ninth chapter. Glory to you, o Lord. Jesus and his disciples went on from there and passed through Galilee. He did not want anyone to know it, for he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, The Son of Man is to be betrayed into human hands, and they will kill him. And three days after being killed, he will rise again. But they did not understand what he was saying, and were afraid to ask him. Then they came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, What were you arguing about on the way? But they were silent, for on the way they had argued with one another about who was the greatest. He sat down, called the twelve, and said to them, Whoever wants to be first must be last of all and servant of all. Then he took a little child and put it among them, and taking it in his arms, he said to them, Whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me welcomes not me, but the one who sent me. The Gospel of the Lord. If you are a parent of teenagers, or have ever been a parent of teenagers, or if you yourself were once a teenager, then you may know that the only time teenagers ever really talk is when you are taxiing them to and fro, from school to activity to home. <coughs> Almost all of my best conversations are held in the 10 to 20 minutes that they are held captive in the confines of my Chevy Traverse. I remember my mom sharing with me once that the best piece of parenting advice she ever received as a young mother was to spend 10 minutes individually with your kids every day. At the time she told me this, I remember thinking it was a ludicrous statement because basically I had not even 10 minutes to myself. So of course I thought I was always going to be spending 10 minutes with my kids. But as they grew up, I learned what a profound statement that was, or is still. So just recently I was in the car, I was having my 10 minutes alone with my son Cooper. If you've met Cooper, you may know this, he is driven when it comes to baseball. Obsessed or fanatical may be a more accurate word. And as he has matured, he's learned that much of success or greatness is mental. By altering your thinking, you're able to see situations differently. Now, it took me until I was about 35 years old to comprehend this reality, so I basically feel like he's ahead of the game. Anyway, the other day, we're on our way home from practice, and he starts telling me about this motivational talk he's been listening to by Matthew McConaughey entitled 13 Truths. Apparently, he has listened to it every day for about two weeks, and it's about 40 minutes long, so he's fairly into this uh, Matthew McConaughey thing. And he suggests that I listen to it, because we share the driven gene when it comes to athletics. However, the thing he chooses to focus on in Ma is McConaughey's description of joy and happiness and how they differ from one another. Now, I'm not really going to go into all of it because as enjoyable as I may find Matthew McConaughey, I eventually need to get to Jesus today. But Cooper tells me what he's learned about the difference between joy and happiness. And I'm stunned, and I agree with him, and I'm proud of him. And I'm also a little sad, and I don't, that's not even quite the right word as I was writing this, I was like, right, that's the right word for this emotion, maybe it's conflicted. So I say to him, you know, that's the same thing we'd say in church, joy is a gift and happiness is a momentary creation. We'd say that joy is what you experience when you're most fully you. As if to defend the church and make sure he knows this is a Jesus thing and not a McConaughey thing. Well, he nods, right, because he knows this. He's heard me preach on it. He's heard it from in church from the time he was a wee child, that goodness and not greatness comes from God. But I am so very struck that he's heard the gospel proclaimed in a YouTube video by a Hollywood actor, not in a church and not by a pastor, which is so good, the world needs but it certainly gave me pause. In today's Gospel reading, the disciples are arguing about greatness. And we have been at it ever since. Disagreement among Christians is as old as the faith itself, particularly on the topic of what it looks like to follow Jesus faithfully in a given time and place. And 
sometimes we, as followers of Jesus, have been more intent on doctrine than on the gospel, more intent on being great than being loving, more intent on power than on the way of the cross. Too often the Bible has become a moral weapon or the words of Jesus has been somehow used to bolster our own opinions. And so this week, as if on cue from Jesus, I took the advice of the child who shared with me his wisdom about hearing the gospel in unexpected places. Now I'll be honest with you, the reason I took this challenge is twofold. First, let's be honest. The church doesn't have the voice it used to. People don't necessarily give a lot of credence to it anymore or show up on Saturdays or Sundays, which is a whole different conversation. And second, if I'm honest, I've heard a lot of advertisements, slogans, and policies lately which perpetuate building oneself up on the backs of others. And I could get into all of those, but I really didn't want to. I wondered, I wondered good out there that proclaimed the gospel. So we're going to start here with a message from the secular world that probably illustrates Jesus's point today better than I could. Because Cooper taught me another little lesson in that 10 minutes. Sometimes the message comes from unexpected sources. Now as a disclaimer, I feel like I have to say this, there is, this is in no way an endorsement for the company that actually puts out this commercial. Please go ahead. 99% of people think they are nobody. 97% of companies are small companies. 92% of countries are small countries. 95% of athletes are unknown. Small can be calculated, but it cannot be ignored. So, we have a different point of view on small. We believe a small character has unrivaled power. A small action can touch millions of people. A small step forward can set a new record. A small change can create a difference. A small corner can impact the whole world. A small country story can inspire all humanity. From small to big, everyone is making a difference. Alibaba believes in the power of small. We are proud to be the worldwide partner of the Olympic Games, giving everyone an equal chance. Together, we're in this game. From one to billions, we see the power of small. To the greatness of small. Alibaba, the company that put on that commercial, they didn't invent the concept. The greatness of small and they aren't the only ones who believe in the power of small. Jesus invented it, right? And he believes in the power of small and knows that there's power and weakness and, and it shows us that love really does change the world. Jesus on the cross is the epitome of giving up any kind of greatness he possesses, including his divinity. Alibaba just basically co-opted the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I can't help but wonder why. Now here's the truth. Um, they did use it to promote themselves, right? There is no getting around that, and maybe that's not so great. But if you're anything like me, your heart lightens and your soul soars a bit watching that commercial. It reminds you that goodness is more powerful than greatness. And Alibaba must know that the world needs that message. Jesus certainly does. There is power in small, there is power in the child, there is power in sacrifice, and power in solidarity. There is power in love. And that's the power of God. And I think that that's Jesus' whole point. When he scoops up that child and places her in his lap and says, Whoever welcomes
welcomes one such child in my name so welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me welcomes not me, but the one who sent me. Because those 10 minutes with that child turn the world on its head. Now, make no mistake, this is hard stuff. Ali Baba makes it look easy, and even Jesus' reaction to the disciples absolutely totally missing the point again and again, maybe even indicates that we should get it. But it was hard for the disciples, and it's hard for us. Because almost instinctively, we look out for ourselves rather than others. We trust more in our wealth for security than we do in God, and we shut others out rather than invite them in, seeking our own welfare rather than those around us. But here is the thing. The road the disciples are traveling to on is the road to Jerusalem. And that's the place where everything changes. And it may be a small detail in this story, but it is small things that change the world. Jesus is on that road with them. Even while his disciples misunderstand, don't believe, or just plain ignore what he's saying, Jesus continues to walk towards the cross with them willing to sacrifice everything for them and for us.